God, this morning we come. Lord, we come with our baskets full of seeds, Lord. Our lives full of hope and expectation in you. And we thank you, Lord God, that whatever season we find ourselves in, that you are there in our midst. That you walk before us, you come behind us. And that you are our all in all. We worship you this morning in this place, in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Baldavis Church this morning. How are you all? You had a good morning so far? Great. The senior pastor is away this morning, and we have the lovely Alethea preaching for us. Pastor Alethea is going to be preaching, so give her a big hand when she comes up later on. You don't have to do it right now. But later on, make her feel comfortable and ready to go. She's got a great word for us, and I can't wait to hear it. Good morning, Alethea. Listen, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. Just say hello to someone. Find someone that's near to you and say, good morning. Welcome to church. Church is cool. An otherwise hot day. I feel the breeze blowing, it's blowing in my eyes. I feel the breeze blowing. Have a seat, church. So as Derek just said, our senior pastor is away this morning preaching at East Lake Church in Mandurah, but he's back this evening to continue his series in angels. I don't want to challenge every one of you to be here. Let's fill the house, let's come and worship God again this evening, and let's um, really blow Pastor Gordon's mind when he sees the church full this evening. So I challenge every one of you to be here. Um, just take out your newsletters now that you received when you came in. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things in those. Last week, um, Pastor Gordon encouraged you to start giving to help pay off the current debt that we still have as a church for the buildings and you'll see some envelopes attached to your flyers this morning to do that so I just want you to pray about that to think about that and to give generously to pay off that debt so that as a church we're in a much better place to build again this time next week we'll be in the middle or maybe quarter of the way through our big baptism celebratory service it's going to be an awesome service. We've got seven people already agreed to be baptised. Um, so they're ready to be obedient to God. Um, they're ready to go through the waters of baptism. But I'm believing there's more of you. God hasn't finished speaking to you all yet. Um, there is more of you that are going to be baptised next Sunday. If you are thinking about that, if you need more information, if you're not sure, if you've got questions, there's a baptism class running in the Children's Ministry Centre, quarter past 11, after the service this morning. And you can just come and drop into that and have those questions and those answers, hopefully, talked through. Um, otherwise, tick a box on your care card to say that you're thinking about baptism or just turn up next week with a dry set of clothes and a towel mm -hmm. and get ready to be obedient to God. And lastly, Sun Stand Still. Who's excited about Sun Stand Still? Sun Stand Still if this, is, if this church is regularly your, your church, if you haven't heard about Sunstand Still, you must have been walking around with your eyes closed and your ears covered because we're excited about Sunstand Still. Um, it's going to be an awesome campaign for us in term one. But to get the best out of it, you do need to be in a connect group. If you're not in a connect group or if the connect group you were in last year really wasn't working for you, will you tick a box on your care card today? and put that um, in the offering bucket as it comes around so that we can get you into a, into a group ready to start the campaign. I just want to read to you a little, a little bit. This is, um, Sun Stand Still is really about praying audacious prayers, living with audacious faith. And Steve Furtick says, faith is contagious. You will be empowered when you surround yourself with people who will help to bear the burden of your Sun Stand Still prayer. They'll help you keep the vision in sight when there's nothing to see. They'll remind you of God's faithfulness when your own faith is faltering. They'll increase the effectiveness of your prayer by joining their faith with yours. Christians find their faith team through their local church, not just the Sunday morning gathering either, but small groups. For us, that's connect groups where you can dig deeper. No one's faith can survive long alone. So that really just demonstrates the importance of you being in a group and the importance of you having the opportunity to share a little bit deeper what's going on, to get the support. If we're going to pray big prayers, 
we need to have support around us. So tick those boxes on your care cards. If you're new with us, you can register your details on your care card. If you've got a prayer or praise point, you can pop that on the bottom of your care card or send an encouraging note to someone. But get ticking in with those boxes, baptism and connect groups. And I meant to say now, sorry, I forgot. But Church News is going to be on the screen. <laughs> and included in that is more Sun Stand Still um, information, including a little interview clip from last week. So watch that to hear more about Sun Stand Still. Getting excited? I am so excited. And I, 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 I kind of put a little, something a little bit out there, which I'm about to do now. And uh, you'll all get excited about this right now. Uh, Catherine and Mandy, would you come on up here, please? <laughs> come on, right up. Come on. Come on. Bit of excitement. Come on. <laughs> I told them I might do this, and I said I might not, but I might, and I don't know if I will or not. And they said, what are you going to ask us? And I said, I don't know. It's spontaneous. <laughs> Chris brought me a word that he got a word for you from the Lord. He said, and the word is spontaneous. And if I thought I wasn't going to do this, then that egged me on. I am. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Spontaneity. Wow. Hey, hey when this all came about, and, and of course, I got all the information, and I'm now on my iPad and iPhone, I've got the Elevation app, so you just press that and you're straight into all their messages, all their blogs and whatever they've got, and they've got a lot of stuff. Pastor Bron, you've got that book, didn't you? Is that good? You scribbled it in it yet? Yes, she has. That's a good thing. See, with the e-version, maybe, I don't know, you might have figured out how to scribble on the e-version. I haven't, but I scribble in the book, all right? So it's good to get the book. And so I, uh, I put this out to these guys and I gave them a couple of clips and offices closed and they went back to the office before I did after Christmas, but I'm still in touch with them. I gave them this stuff and they had, they had uh, like little links on the websites and they got excited, didn't you guys? Tell me what excited you, Mandy. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've been sort of living and breathing Sun Stand Still Elevation Church, Steve Furtick, for the last couple of weeks. In fact, I've probably become a bit of a number one fan or a junkie or something. But. Um, Listening to his stories, listening to what God has done through him at Elevation Church and in his life and through his son's standstill prayers, that's great. But I believe that this is bigger than that. This isn't about his stories. This is about here and now in Baldivis. This is about each and every one of our lives. God is going to do the impossible. He is indeed. Um, and I believe that we're going to see God move in a mighty way through this campaign. So if you're not excited, get excited. If you're not scared, get scared. That's right. <laughs> um, because we're going to see God move through this. And he is going to do, and he can do, all of the impossible things in our lives. Fantastic. So. Yeah. Catherine, you got hold of the stuff. I sent it to you. In fact, I think I gave it to you first. And I said, pass it on to the rest of the staff. So uh, now, you, 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 you've seen what happened to Mandy, right? And you're down in your office. And you hear stuff happening, right? And you're up there to see what's going on next. <laughs> she was sat at Man Amanda Austin's desk because was, Amanda was on a holiday, so I could hear everything that she was doing. <laughs> but the thing that excited me the most is that I knew that we were heading to do um, more to life. But then when Pastor Gordon started talking about Sun Stand Still, and I knew about Stephen Furtick, and we'd heard him at GLS, and he spoke about start digging ditches. If you're going to pray for rain, dig, dig, dig ditches. Which means, you know, if you're praying for something, you expect to get it. So he was talking about digging ditches. Now I, I got excited because I knew that it was God who was changing the course of what we'd planned to do. And then God had come and cut in and we now changed in a different direction. And we're heading to do Sunstand still. So I know that God's going to do mighty things. And that's what was exciting me. It, it totally is exciting. Uh, I was about to fly to Singapore and Kath and I had been having this talk. And I'm in the airport, just gone through the customs thing there. And I text Catherine and say, order the Sunstand still kit. And she says, will do. And I got back here in Singapore and it's ordered and it's, that's the way we're going because that's the way God is leading. Guys, thank you very, very much. Uh, take a seat and if Karen can hang on that for me. Just as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings this morning, I think God wants to talk to us about faith. Thank you, for Man Mandy, for what you shared this morning. I was looking at our poor little faith over there. Look at him. Now, do you know what? Derek actually went over and, and fixed it before the service. He was looking like that in rehearsal. And Derek lovingly, lovingly went over and put it all back together. And it spoke to me about the fact that this is the place to come, where you were planted, where your home church is, to come and have your faith restored, to have it strengthened, to not be alone. 
and sometimes it's okay. <laughs> Get in a connect group, there's more of them to help you. <laughs> no. Our God is such a good God. And there are times in our lives when we feel like our faith is being tested. And that's okay. God wants to refine us. He wants to melt out the grot that's in our life. The things that we've held onto that we think this is the way life is and this is the way I am. And God goes, mm -mm. no. No, you're at a place where you can deal with this now and I'm going to lovingly refine you and turn the heat up a little as the heat's been turned up on our faith sticker over there. And he will be restored. I guarantee it. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. And the heat's turned up and it's getting a bit hot because we know that our suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So we come and we face the everyday, the everyday of balancing the budget, the everyday of being a, a mum, the everyday of being a husband, of being a wife, of being a single person, of being a grandparent, whatever it is. Our God is for us. He is with us and as we honour him this morning and this coming week with our tithes and offerings, take a moment to just thank him that when the heat is up, that he's just that much closer. He's stepping in closer and going, come on, you can, you can handle this. It's okay, I'm here. I'm with you. Sun Stand Still is going to take us whew, to yet another place, an exciting place. Don't be afraid. Be faith-filled. Rejoice as you give this morning. Rejoice as you come and you hear God's word from Aletheia in a little while. Lord God, we just ask your blessing upon this money that we bring, Lord, that you would do far more abundantly and amazingly than we can ever ask or imagine. God, it is your faithfulness to us that we, we just give thanks for that, Lord God. May we honour you in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. During the singing of this next song, the buckets will be passed around. You can place your tithes, your offerings and your care cards in those.
um, please take a seat. Um, for those who may not be aware, my role here at the church is I'm the youth pastor. So, and youth is going back, not next week. We're going back on the 10th of February, so that's my little plug for youth. 10th of February, don't turn up next Friday because we're not going to be here. Right there, <laughs> thanks Tanya. <laughs> so, yeah. So we're expecting great things, aren't we? I love that song, because we want to expect great things. And God, he's doing great things amongst us. And I am actually on the tiptoe of expectation. He's going to move powerfully in this church. And it's exciting. I can feel it. It's tangible. Um, He's going to use us mightily, our church, us in the church, and our church to bless this community. And who is ready to see revival happen? Yeah. Um, and I'm going to claim before God today and before you all that this year we will see revival in this church. And that's my audacious sun stand still prayer for the life of this church. In saying that, revival starts first of all with our complete surrender, with the complete surrender of God's people to his will. Revival isn't solely about va- evangelism. It's a part of it and it comes later. But it's rather it's about God's people his church, getting it right, finding its purpose in being the bride of Christ, in being the kingdom of God on this earth. And that starts on an individual level. It starts with you. So you need to ask yourself today, are you ready to completely surrender to God? That means giving complete control of your life over to God and allowing him to be the Lord of your life. It means total obedience to him in every facet of your world. And that can be a bit scary. And especially if you're a little bit of a control freak like I am. (laughs) So this morning I'm going to talk to you a bit about what complete surrender of your life looks like. So we're going to look at three areas of our lives. Our stuff, that's all our material possessions, our money, all the stuff we have. Our people, meaning our relationships and with our friends, our families, our co-workers. And, our ch- and finally ourselves, surrendering our hopes, our dreams, our desires, our plans for the future. So to start off with, I want, to s- want you to help me with doing this exercise. So I'm asking for audience participation. If your house was on fire, what would be the one thing that you would grab, that you would try and save? Uh, Kids? <laughs> yeah, it's always good. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Photos usually is a common one, heirlooms. Usually it's sentimental stuff. And because that's what's important to us. That's what's really important when it comes down to us. Now, when I was a child, a family friend of ours had a house fire and they lost everything. Luckily, no one was hurt. Um, The whole family, they were safe. They just had nothing at the end. And after they were over that shock and the trauma, they actually said, and it confused me a bit as a teenager, but I understand it now, that it was actually freedom in having nothing. There was, um, in losing everything, gave them liberty because they continued to praise God. They were healthy. They weren't tied down by this accumulation of stuff. And I believe that our Western culture, we actually have what I call a stuff epidemic. (laughs) We always need the newest, the bestest, the fastest. Ads tell us that we need things that we don't. We've got problems that we've never heard of before, but we need this to fix it. (laughs) Um, We just need it. Now, I'm in the process of buying myself a new car. I'll get it in a couple of weeks. Yes, very exciting. And, and due to that, I'm, I'm trading in my current one, which I've had for 13 years, and I bought it new. And that was a point of conversation with everybody in the dealership. She's had her car for 13 years, and they just kept going on and on. It got to the point that I had to start justifying, well, it's never broken down. It's a good car. It was my first car, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But I didn't know why I felt I had to justify keeping my car for 13 years. <laughs> the world tells us that we need more and more stuff to keep us happy, to fulfill our needs. It tells us that the accumulation of wealth should be our first priority in life so that we're able to provide for ourselves and our family. That's the way of the world. It is not the way of God. And are we trusting the world or are we trusting God? Luke 12 29 to 31 in the New Living Testament translation and says, And do not be concerned about what to eat, what to drink. Do not worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God 
above all else and he will give you everything you need. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against being prosperous and wealthy, but if that's our focus in life, if that, we are focusing on the wrong thing, the question I'm putting to you today is, are you re- prepared to surrender all you have, all your possessions, all your money for the kingdom of God? Seriously, that's the question I'm asking. If God spoke to you this morning and said, I want you to put your entire life savings into that building fund a- account to help us pay down the debt, are you prepared to do that? Remember, God knows your needs. He'll provide for you if you are faithful to him. So if you have your Bibles with you today, I would like you to turn with me to 1 Kings 17. And I want to read you a story about a woman who gave everything she had to God. So I'm starting in uh, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil at the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. But Elisha said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead, do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first and then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord of God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time the Lord sends the rains and the crops grow again. So she did, as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her son continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour, olive oil and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Now what's phenomenal about this story is that this widow, she had nothing of worth. A little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, just enough to make a last meal for herself. And then the next thing she was planning to do was to die. It's not rather depressing and it seems rather hopeless. And then along comes Elijah, this man of God, who then asked her to share what little bit she had. I'm not 100% sure that I would have been willing to give up what I had to him. But she, better than me, she trusted that God would provide and that he would fulfill her promises to her. And God used what little the widow had to perform a miracle. This is not isolated. This happens again and again in the Bible. In John 6, we read about the feeding of the 5,000. You're probably aware of the story. Everyone had been listening to Jesus' teaching all day and the goat getting hungry. So Jesus sent his disciples into the crowds to, um, to see what food they can find amongst the crowd. Picking it up from verse 9. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two full small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was, a pl- there was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. They didn't count women and children back then. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When they had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by by those who had eaten. Again, God used what that kid had to bless and feed others. He didn't have to give up his lunch. He chose to surrender it, what he had to serve Jesus. And then God used his sacrifice to feed the crowds. Imagine if we surrendered everything we had, our money, our possessions, into the service of God. Can you just imagine what miracles would see happen in our lives and in the lives of those around us? It doesn't have to be anything special. It's just whatever you have in your hand. A bit of flour and oil probably fed the village. Um, A loaf of bread and a cup of fish fed over 5,000 people with leftovers. Jesus tells us, Luke 12, 29, 32 in the message. What I'm trying to get you 
trying to do here is to get you to relax, not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Don't be afraid of missing out. You're my dearest friends. The Father wants to give you the kingdom, the very kingdom itself. God, remember, God knows what we need. And if he's told you to give someone something, or to increase your offering, or just to tithe regularly, which he does tell us to do in the Bible, he will not leave you wanting. He'll provide for you, even if you can't see how it will happen. It's called faith. And God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. So that's sort of covering the surrendering our material possessions to God. But we also need to prepare to surrender our people, our relationships to God, both our good and our bad relationships. 2 Corinthians 6.17, don't link up with those who will pollute you. I want you all for myself. Now, I rather like this imagery in the message. People can pollute each other. This is, a passage, this is in a passage of scripture which talks about being unequal, unequally yoked. The most common application used in Christian circles is um, marriage between a Christian and non-Christian, which, yes, that is an application, but that's not the only thing it's talking about. It's talking about any relationship which would distract you or take you away from God and his purposes, be it a, a friendship or a relationship with a colleague, a business partner, or even with a family member. If it's pulling your focus away from God, and his purposes for your life, it may need reassessing. And it can even be a relationship that was within the church, church life context. God may be t asking you or to, to distance yourself from someone, not because they're bad or anything, but just that the two of you are a bad mix together. We see it with kids, especially in kids' church. Two kids that are, are great, they're attentive, they participate, and that sort of stuff on their own but you sit them next to one, another child and you know it's going to be trouble. You remove them and in that context, we're able to separate them and ask them to sit somewhere else, put them in a different group, that sort of thing. It's not so easy to do that with adults. I couldn't say, Emma, you need to move from James because you're distracting each other. I can't do that. Well, I could, but she won't listen to me. <laughs> so it's not that easy with adults, but because we get to choose who we interact with. We get to choose our relationships and our friendships. So we need to make wise decisions about who we allow to have input in our lives. Proverbs 12, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, meaning that those around us will mold and shape our character. It's why we encourage our children to be wise in their choice of friends. And it applies to us as well. So. In that, to that end, we can choose our friends. Doesn't it help us with family? Because <laughs> we don't get to choose our family. But we actually get to be able to choose our reactions and, and how we let our family input into our lives. Matthew 10, 37. If you love your father and mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. I know a lot of people can struggle with this verse and this concept. At first glance, it can seem pretty harsh. How harsh that you must love something or someone more than your own children? I mean, is that even possible? But there are two memorable examples in the Bible of parents who love God so much they were willing to surrender their children to him. The first that I want to talk about is Abraham. He was asked by God to go travel up a mountain and sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering. They travelled for about three days and before they got to their designated place of sacrifice, um, Isaac asked them, who'd been carrying the wood up this mountain, asked them, where is his sheep? We've got the fire, the wood, but what about the sheep? And Abraham's answer was, God will provide. Now if I was Isaac, I might have been questioning a bit more. You know, it's like, oh, are we there yet? He'll be like, where's the sheep yet? Where's the sheep? But Abraham's answer was, God will provide. So you need to put, put yourself in Abraham's position. This is the son that God had promised you. This is the son that God had promised nations were going to be blessed through. But then God turned around and told him to burn him as a sacrifice. But it was about faith. 
Abraham got to the point where Isaac was tied up on the altar, altar, altar and he had a knife to his throat until God intervened. He said, stop, don't hurt him. I now know that you will not withhold anything from me. Genesis 22:15 to 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from he- called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says: Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your own son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond the numbers like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of the enemies and through your descendants the nations of earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. The second example of parental surrender is Hannah. Now Hannah was a godly woman, but she was very sad because she had actually been unable to have children. And because of this, she was ridiculed and mocked by others. And so basically, she was pretty depressed about it. And her husband, while supportive, did not quite understand her misery. In 1 Samuel 8, he says, Why are you crying? Alcanor would ask her husband. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted? Just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? (laughs) Now, (laughs) Alcanor was not, obviously not lacking in self-confidence. But despite being married to the great Elkanah, she was still sad and deeply desired a son. So Hannah prayed. 1 Samuel 1.10, Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. She made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. Hannah was praying so fervently and passionately that Eli, the tabernacle priest, actually thought she was drunk. But God heard her and she fell pregnant and she gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel, which literally means I asked the Lord for him. And after Samuel was weaned, she took him back to the tabernacle and surrendered her son to Eli, just as she promised God she would. 1 Samuel 1, 25, after sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked, I'm the woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy and he has granted my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord and he will be, belong to the Lord his whole life. And then they worship the Lord there. Now, admittedly, these are rather extreme examples of surrendering your family to God. I don't believe that you're going to go home and have God tell you to ritually sacrifice your child no matter how much trouble they're giving you. (laughs) I promise. Nor should you be dropping them off at the church office for the staff to to take care of. You don't want that for your child. (laughs) But you are the greatest influence in your child's life. (laughs) Joshua 24, 15. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you'll serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors who served beyond the Euphrates or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Parents, you actually get to choose who are children while they are still children that they will serve the Lord. Now, I'm always careful about giving advice to parents because I'm aware that I'm not a parent myself. So most of my knowledge is theoretical, but I do have a lot of experience working with children. And my sisters and I, we were raised in a Christian home by Christian parents. So while I don't have practical experience in parenting, I actually know what it's like to be a child and grow up going to church and being raised in church life. So I do believe I have a reasonable understanding of what works and what doesn't. So if you want your children to grow up to be godly men and women of faith, it starts with you. You need to demonstrate the importance of God in your life. And you do this by putting church first every Sunday, And believe it, it's much easier to do this while they're young than once they're grown and teenagers and got a mind of their own. (laughs) It's so much easier to do it when they're yet little. (laughs) Proverbs 22, 6. Direct your children onto the right path and when they are older, they will not leave it. So as a child, we didn't miss church. We went to both morning and evening. It didn't matter that evening church went past our bedtimes. God is more important than that. And as church... And church was where we went to learn about God and to worship him. And as I got older, you know, I grew up, I became a teenager. That's what happens. 
I started, I started you know, socialising more and I went, I had sleepovers with um, friends and stuff. And I was allowed to go. I wasn't a social pariah. But if they fell on a Saturday, I had, my responsibility was to get to church or to get myself home in time to go with my family to church. And sometimes that involved a 5K walk to get to church. But I did it. It, it didn't even occur to me not to go. I have no idea what my mum would have done if I didn't turn up one Sunday. I probably would have been grounded and not allowed out for a month. But that's what happened. But it's not like I wanted to be there. I, we lived in a small country town. So we went to, there was only two choices, Catholic Church or Anglican. Not, nothing against either of those. We went to the Anglican. But as a 13-year-old, going to a church with that we played organ, we sang hymns, we handed out prayer books and I was the youth of my church. That was it. There was no youth ministry, no youth group. It was Alethea all by herself. So I didn't particularly, I didn't particularly want to be there, but I did. I knew it was important and my parents had instilled in us from a young age that we need to support the church we planted in. And at the time, I probably didn't appreciate it. I spent my moments sitting in the back row sulking. Yeah, I did that. But I knew it was important to be at church. And I can look back now and appreciate all the, the discipline and the, and the um, lessons my parents taught me by doing that. So you also need to talk to your children about God. Don't just leave it for a Sunday. You need to talk about every day. Share with them your favourite Bible verses. Pray with them. Tell them what God has been teaching you through your connect groups or your quiet times. Also, I'm going to say make them participate in church programs. You're the parent, remember? We, got, we do kids' church. We do youth groups. We even play groups for toddlers and that sort of stuff. Your children will follow your example. If you make, ensure your children are involved in church life, they'll grow around Christian people and they'll have Christian influences, which will not leave them when they're older. So you can, you can be like Joshua and choose that your family will serve the Lord. And you need to be, be the person that you want your children to become. So now we come to the difficult task of completely surrendering ourselves to God. Psalm 139. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. So God has already prepared a path of good works for you to do. You just, and we all need to just choose to walk it. We need to and surrender our own plans and our own dreams and our own ego for his better plans. Now, I like making plans. I'm a planner. I have plans for youth group. I have plans for study. I've got travel plans. I've got plans to try and keep cool this week. <laughs> yeah, I have no air conditioning, so it's really hard. Long hours at work. But <laughs> I need to submit to the plan of God for my life because sometimes when I look at my plans, I've actually planned God out of my life. So that's when I need to come back to God and get down on my knees and humble myself before God because he has better plans than I do. I need to surrender my plans to God and trust that the path God has set for me will be blessed and his kingdom will be blessed through that. And it'll be far more than what I believe possible. And I can believe a lot, but God's plans are greater than that. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. And I admit it, there are times in my life when it's not going the way I want it to. I mean, I'm 31 years old. I'm still single. And that, to be honest, is not what I had planned when I was 15. Nor when I was 20. Nor when I was 25. <laughs> But, and that's not, I don't want to be set up in a myriad of blind dates because I just don't have time. <laughs> but I do know that because I am single, God can use me in ways that he couldn't if I had a family and I had children to look after. And I have opportunities to serve and influence God and the kingdom, even wider than this church. And I wouldn't have had that otherwise. And there is nothing more important to me than serving God. And I'm willing to surrender those plans and those dreams so that I can bring glory to him. Matthew 10, 38 to 39 in the message says, if you don't go all the way with me, through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, 
you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. As God's people, we must be willing to surrender our plans and dreams for God, for God's, knowing that He has a greater plan and that He has a greater future in store for us than what we believe. Now, the greatest example of surrender that I can think of in the Bible happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, the night before he was crucified, he knew what was coming. And to be honest, he wasn't looking forward to it. I can't, I don't blame him. I can't imagine I would look forward to being whipped and tortured and crucified on a cross. Pretty horrific. But anyway, he went to pray in the garden. And praying is always a good thing to do in times of anguish. And it's a good thing to do during times of joy. But anyway, Matthew records Jesus saying, or praying this, he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. But let your will be done rather than mine. Let your will be done rather than mine. That should be our constant prayer. That the Father's will will be done and not ours. The, the key to this is obedience. It's not just enough to believe in God because we are told that even the demons believe and they shudder. But we need to obey God. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 to 8 in the New King James Version says, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, they stumble. That verse puts... Um, belief and disobedience as antonyms, which means that they're opposites. John Bevere in his book, Heart Blaze, which is available in our bookshop, um, actually explains this verse much better than I could. So I'm just going to read directly from his book. And he's talking about Peter's use of belief and disobey in that verse. John Bevere says, he contrasts the words believe and disobey. We cannot do that today. Currently, the word believe has nothing to do with obedience or disobedience. That is why many within the church do not emphasize obedience. However, in the days of the New Testament writers, they were closely connected. <clears throat> to believe meant not only to acknowledge his existence, but also to obey. In other words, if you were believed, you obeyed. And the evidence of not believing was a disobedient lifestyle. Obedience is a crucial element of salvation. Jesus himself notes that there will be a multitude who will believe in him and call him Lord and even do miracles in his name, yet they will be denied entrance into the kingdom of God because they did not do or obey the will of God. It's rather heavy that you need to completely surrender yourself to God and to obey him and follow his words because the consequences is that you might not get into heaven. So if we are willing to surrender ourselves to God, that means we need to surrender everything, our families, our plans, our dreams, our money, all of our possessions to God and his plans for us. He needs to be the most important thing in our life. And God is going to use whatever we have, what little we have to bless others, to bless the church and through the church to bless the world. We don't need to worry if there's going to be enough or anything left over for us. God knows what we need and he is our provider. So Luke writes about the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 11 verse 21. And he says, The presence of the Lord was with them with power so that, so that, so that a great number learned to believe, to adhere to, to trust in and rely on the Lord and, and turned and surrendered themselves to him. So we need to believe, we need to trust and rely on the Lord and surrender ourselves to him. And then God is going to use us almightily. That's the first and most important step is to, we can take, we need to completely surrender ourselves to God. So I want to ask you again this morning, what is it that you need to surrender to him? It could be a work situation, it could be your finances, it could be your family, it could be just yourself wholly and completely, maybe for the first time ever. Only you can answer the question. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have a plan for us and that your plan is to prosper us and not to harm us, that you have a plan for a hope and a future, Lord. I pray that um, 
you help us to surrender everything to you, Lord. We ask for a revelation. I ask for a revelation in everyone's lives here this morning. I ask that you will just bless them and that you will highlight to them what they need to give to you, Lord. I just pray that everyone will be blessed and that we will go out and bless this community. Right now, during the last song, we're going to have, we call it an altar call. It's an opportunity for you to come and surrender whatever it is to God. So during the last song, if you feel that like God's been talking to you, prompting you, or and that he's just asking you to surrender something, just come. It's not scary, it's not thing, but it's a, it's a visual sign of your obedience and your willingness to surrender to him. strength and in you we can surrender and we can trust in you and that you will always be faithful to us Lord. I pray as we go out this week that we will um, find moments of just of just your divine presence Lord during this week that we will know truly and completely that you are our God in your name Amen now don't forget that after service we have over in the CMC back to the class if you have any questions or any queries Attend the class, go see Mandy, and um, she'll walk you through it. And next week is our great, our baptismal service. So just come, just be here. If you're thinking about baptism, go to the class or just turn up and, and we'll walk you through it. Um, it's going to be a great day and we're believing for many baptisms and many people are going to come to God. You know, that's great. So right now this, this room, auditorium is for fellowship, uh, for ministry and that sort of stuff so the fellowship is out in the coffee shop and in the foyer and out the back so have a great week everyone